back. Chase, welcome to Sports Matters. Nice to be here. And welcome back to Singapore. You were here 12 months ago for the first time, as I understand it? Um, first time at a race. I've been to Singapore before, yes. but okay. uh, it's nice to be back again. Well, listen, we're delighted to have you to talk about the future of Formula One. As many fans in the audience will know, last year that future was quite unclear. There was a lot of uncertainty, there was a lot of speculation, and there was a lot of concern about the sport, particularly the ownership, the succession plan, and the financial viability of the team. So following the recent acquisition by Liberty Media earlier this year, um, I've been privileged enough to go to Albert Park and to Monza, and I've sensed the real palpable sense of change and excitement around the sport. So first of all, congratulations. Well, you've, it's early days, yeah. you've got a lot to do. But you've had the keys to Formula One now for a little over six months. Correct. Originally in the role as chairman, and then you took over the role as chief executive. Right. So tell us, how have you found the roles? Um, well, it's been a good you know, start um, to, you know, to our, from the transition in ownership and management six to seven months ago. Um, it is early days. Um, you know, most of our work is still ahead of us. Um, but we think it's a fabulous opportunity. I mean, when I first got involved, which was a little over a year ago, um, when Liberty called about this opportunity, um, you know, what intrigued me most was uh, this is a fabulous, it's a fabulous sport, you know, great, great worldwide fans, you know, incredible event, you know, um, you know, really a sport that shocks and awes you with sort of speed, sound, um, power, um, but a sport in many ways that we think wasn't really achieving its potential, you know, and I think that was the most exciting part of it, um, that we thought, um, you know, there were really some exciting things we could do to enable the sport to really achieve um, what it could. Okay, well, we'll come on to that in a moment. You've had considerable success at 21st Century Fox, at DirecTV, and at News Corp. And in fact, at one time, you were tipped to be Rupert Murdoch's successor. How do you think your past has prepared you for Formula One, in particular, the visceral competitiveness, the huge personalities both in and, and outside the paddock, and also the, the different and diverse stakeholders? Um, I guess in many ways, I think there are probably two aspects of you know, my career that um, sort of serve, you know, I think serve well in the Formula One uh, environment. You know, one in Fox News Corp, DirecTV, they were all places where by and large the key was building businesses, you know, either building businesses from scratch or building businesses that really were not, you know, where we thought they could be. So, you know, whether it was Sky or Star or Fox Sports or the Fox Network or DirecTV coming out of a failed merger with, uh, with Dish, um, businesses that we thought really had a potential to be trans transformed into something much more than they were. Um, but knowing those, you know, the challenges, what it takes to get a business from here to there, it's rarely a straight line. Um, yes. You know, it is, you've got to fight through the tough times and figure out what are the keys, you know, to success. And so, you know, I think you've experienced, you know, um, in an array of fields, um, you know, those challenges and those opportunities. And I think the other thing is sports has always been a, you know, a large part of what has driven those businesses. Um, and um, while motorsports is probably not a sport, you know, I knew as well as many others, um, the, all sports sort of have a, a degree of similarity in terms of what drives them, you know, engagement with fans, um, you know, managing teams, managing a large ecosystem of players that you've got to figure out how do you, uh, how do you navigate, um, you know, what at times can be a lot of cats and dogs, you know, um, that are uh, um, pursuing their own agendas and create a, you know, create a shared vision of, of where, you, you know, where you're trying to get everybody to. I said to you earlier um, at a recent interview that um, it was really one of the most um, inspiring and informative um, ways of communicating and engaging with the press that I've heard in the 30 years that I've been lucky enough to be involved in the sport. And I want to talk about leadership and leadership styles and your leadership team. Can you tell us about your leadership team and what style do you want to imprint on the sport compared to how it was previously managed? Um, yeah, I think we you know, really do um, believe Formula One is, is sort of ripe for a, you know, really a fresh, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, a, a fresh point of view and, a, um, you know, and in some ways begging for it. I mean, with all credit to Bernie Eccleston, who I preceded, I think Bernie um, always want to give him credit for what was built. Um, and I'm sort of ultimately a business that was sold that was probably a hobby decades ago and was sold for $8 billion speaks for itself. Though I think in 
the recent past, again, I think the sport has not probably been doing some of the things it needs to be. Um, and you know, probably there are a handful of themes we've, you know, I think we'll try to bring to it. Um, one, it needs an organization to execute you know, in a world that's so fast changing and so multidimensional today. Um, it is a more complicated world, more competitive world. Um, and really, it was a one-man show in the past. Yep. And I just don't think a one-man show can pursue and develop the opportunities that, you know, to pursue the things you need to to build it. So we're building an organization that starts with um, Ross Braun on the motorsport side, who brings an incredible you know, insights and, and, and credibility and respect you know, to that side, and Sean Bratches, who built ESPN, an organization underneath them that didn't exist before to, to drive, to manage the motorsport side. Um, and the commercial side and provide tools um, you know, like marketing and research um, and capabilities to develop imp you know, incredibly important you know, sort of areas of the future like digital platforms. So you know, one is building an organization um, that's able to execute. Two is you know, um, bringing to it a more of a long-term perspective. I think it's a business in the past was very much driven by deal of the day. Yes. Um, and I think that's probably not served its well, particularly as it's tried to develop itself in certain places and arenas. And, um, and I think for us, we're, you know, we certainly will care about what happens in the short term, but ultimately our real goals are where can we get this business to not in three months, but in three years. And, you know, and that takes a commitment to get there. Um, it takes fighting through, um, you know, the challenges, you know, and building it. Um, so I think that longer term perspective um, you know, is something that is critically important and we hope to bring to it. And I guess the third thing I'd, I'd cite is you know, much more of a sh spirit of partnership amongst yes. the, the larger players. I mean, this is a sport that, and it served them well in the past, it was very much sort of divide and conquer, and every man for themselves. Um, and for us, um, what we're trying to create is more of a shared vision and transparency so that the, the various players, whether it's teams or promoters or sponsors or broadcasters, you know, have a sense and input to where we're trying to go, um, you know, where you know where we think the opportunities are, and grow together, and then figure out how do we how do we benefit from, you know, from that as we build the sport, and make sure, you know, we're doing everything we can to engage fans. At the end of the day, sports are entertainment, sure. um, and it's all about the fan. It's not about the teams. It's about you know, creating something that excites, engages, and you know, and delivers, you know, the, the passionate experience that is so special to fans that makes sports, you know, what they are. Look, it's a it's a great point about partnership because um, the divide and conquer approach that was perhaps synonymous for the previous reign really didn't play well to trying to at least engender or at least arrive at a consensus. So we very much hope that this is going to be more consensus driven. Just on consensus, at the beginning of your tenure, you went on a so-called listening tour. Can you tell us what that involved, what you learned, and what happens next? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you, I mean, for me, the, I mean, to start it, you know, I did call it a listening tour. I mean, um, and as I said earlier, um, it wasn't a sport I knew well. Um, and really, I didn't know many of the players, you know, in it. Um, and so, um, you could probably get a listening and learning you know, tour because it was, it, you know, it was trying to understand what are the frustrations, what are the challenges, um, you know, that each every party has, um, and what are the opportunities. So it's listening to promoters about you know what you know what concerns them. It's listening to teams um, about uh, you know what are their frustrations. Some of them became fairly obvious fairly quickly. I mean, on the team side, when you've got you know, in a few teams spending, you know, the better part of half a billion dollars to compete and others spending a small fraction of that, it's obviously going to, you know, impact the quality of the competition. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, and therefore, you know, since, you know, while we want to create a uh, sport that ultimately is sort of a spectacle, you know, with a race at the center, the race is the center. And we've got to make sure we first and foremost, you know, build around um, a sport that has great competition, great action, the fans can understand, um, and that delivers on all those expectations. And, and you know, while we have a great sport today, clearly I think there's a lot we can do and need to do to make, to make those things better, make the competition, the action, the rules better. You know, provide if part of what makes the sport you know, great is a spectacular speed, sound, and power, you know, to make sure we're delivering on that with an engine that you know, delivers on that capability. Um, and so, 
as we went, or, you know, as you went around, you know, you think trying to understand from various angles, there are, you know, a, 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 an array of themes that I think help us, you know, are going to help us navigate the future. And we're, you know, because we, for the first time, have a staff, we're putting together a, the first version of a longer-term strategic plan that really identifies priorities, um, you know, and uh, and the things we need to achieve to to get to where you know we want to get to longer term. Okay, um, let's talk about sports. Um, you played rugby at Colgate University and at, at Harvard. You are also a Yankees fan, <laughs> as I understand it. And I also read somewhere that you have the seats to the old Yankee Stadium in your office. It was a DirecTV's parting gift to me was two bleachers Fantastic. seats from Yankee Stadium. So my question is, um, how does your love of motorsport compare to what I would describe as your, perhaps, your first loves, rugby and baseball? Um, it's actually interesting. I, um, you know, one of the things that I appreciated sort of being in the sport, after being in the sport for a few months, um, is... Um, is the fact that as I understood it better, and, I, and I, as I said earlier, I didn't come into the sport um, you know, with a deep understanding of the players, the competition, the history. Um, and as I had the chance to understand it better, how quickly it became you know, consuming and you know, captivating. You know, sports is about competition action. I mean, it's sort of, it's human drama. I mean, in many ways, there are themes that cover you know, we all have favorite sports and different sports, but there are themes that cover the spectrum about sports is about heroes. You know, how do you, you know, how do you create that, you know, Tiger Woods, you know, proved it in, you know, in, you know, in golf. I mean, what is, you know, the transformative nature of, of heroes, of competition, of action, there's of a common, drama, there's a of emotion, yes. all those things, um, you know, and, and history. I mean, actually, and, you know, realistically, Formula One has a fabulous, um, you know, set of attributes that cover that spectrum. I mean, you know, stars, you get to a Lewis Hamilton stars that are sort of second to none. You know, we haven't done enough to give them the platform to bring out the dramas and the competition. Um, you know, a sort of fabulous history, incredibly passionate fans. I mean, I was in Mon we were Monza a week ago, and, you know, the Italians were just, you know, spectacular. It was raining all day Saturday, and, you know, they still, every one of them had a smile on their face and yeah. seemed to couldn't be having a better time, even if they were dripping wet. I mean, yeah. it was just a, you know, there's a, such a great passion for this that, um, you know, that again, I didn't know the sport. I knew the things that I, you know, cherish in sports and how quickly, you know, as you understood it better, um, it became, um, you know, really consuming for me and I became, you know, very quickly a fan. And it sort of encourages me, our ability, as people talk about developing the sport in some of the markets where we don't have the historic development in Asia or the US or the markets, that if we, provide fans an ability to better connect, better understand, you know, to get closer to the sport, engage, we can bring in new fans or make a casual fan a passionate fan. Yeah. And it is all about engaging those fans in ways and using all the things you have, all the capabilities you have today um, to engage those fans um, it, that really, I think, you know, excite me about the future. Good. Um, let's change tack slightly. Uh, let's talk about the F1 calendar. Next year there will be 21 races. Yep. Uh, Paul Ricard and Hockenheim are back, which is great. I know that Greg Maffei has voiced his criticism about Baku and Bahrain in particular, not really reflecting the brand of, of Formula One. And there's also concern about the rising costs of hosting fees, and that's one of the reasons why perhaps Silverstone exercised its break clause, so the last race is 2019. Will we see more races on the calendar, or is it a question of strengthening what you have? Well, I think priority one clearly um, has to be quality. I mean, it's you know, it's not, it's not pursuing quantity. Um, you know, I think, you know, our priority one is to make sure every race we have is achieving its full potential, and um, you know, delivering on the experience we've talked about of a week-long spectacular extravaganza um, that uh, you know that really. De delivers up, that captivates fans around the world that are watching it, you know, that, that can't be there, and that fans, you know, um, who are able to go there have an experience to go home and tell their friends about, you know, for months and years to come. So our focus is clearly about making, you know, the races we have, everything, you know, they can and should be. And reality is, the races you cited, I, I, I thought Baku was spectacular. I mean, I hadn't been yeah. to Baku. I thought um, we got lucky. I mean, the race was great, but I think um, the setting was great. I mean, the city was beautiful. 
um, and uh, you know it was it was great to be there. And uh, um, you know, and I think for us, the diversity of cities we have, we want them all to be destination cities. I mean, it's what makes Singapore you know so special. I mean, you know, it's a you know gateway city to Asia, a city that captures people's imagination, an incredible story what it's achieved in you know recent decades, but. Uh, we want to be in cities that capture people's imagination. You know, in diverse cities, we don't want 20 races or 21 races that are the same. We want each race to have its own unique identity and feel. I mean, sort of Formula One, we'll bring in, you know, our job is to bring, come, bring in the Formula One franchise and everything that goes with it, and then partner with those with local expertise and capabilities to, uh, to make the event uh, everything it can and should be. Um, but I think the breadth, of, the breadth of cities we have, you know, we're excited about, we, you know, we do. Look forward to some, you know, some some additions to it. Probably we've talked first and foremost about um, a destination city in the U.S. That we do. You know, we, the, the race in Texas is great, but yes. you know, add a city to a, a New York, Miami, Las Vegas again. The city that captures the world's imagination. Yeah. You know, with a you know, with a race that um, really would bring you know that type of excitement and energy to just, it. Just on that, I mean, I don't know how many people in the room were at the F1 Live London event, but that was experimental. It was hugely successful. Yeah. Does that mean that that London has a chance of hosting a City GP, or is is Zach Brown going to win the day of McLaren? He wants a working GP. So, no, I mean. Well, the UK first is a, you know, UK is a foundation. We've talked about, um, while we want to grow the sport around the world, um, at the same time, the importance of building on the foundation on which the sport's been built, which is Western Europe, mm -hmm. um, and particularly key countries. Certainly, you know, the UK is as important as any. Yes. Um, you know, we're engaged with Silverstone. I mean, I think you've got to differentiate between negotiating tactics and, you know, and their termination yeah. and real. I mean, you know, yeah. we live in a, you know, getting deals done always has some complexities to it. So, you know, I think the fact that they you know, chose to do the termination when they did it and the like is probably as good an indication as any of, you know, sort of it was posturing that anything else. Um, we have great crowds. I mean, the crowd in the UK is, is, is incredible. Yes. I mean, it was my first time going to Silverstone. There, you know, for miles, you see fields of, of camps and tents. Um, you know, it's, uh, there is interest from other places um, in the UK. There are opportunities there. So Silverstone is clearly one of the, um, you know, sort of iconic uh, events, you know, on our calendar. Um, you know, we will be in the UK. You know, we, I mean, we're fortunate to have interest from many places. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll evaluate each and see what makes sense. Wherever we go, we, you know, we, we do want to engage a sort of host city, you know, sort of not just the, yep. you know, we wanted it to be an event that isn't just a track-based event, but it is an event that the city consumes when you're in the city. We, you know, the week of a Grand Prix, we want you to know you're in a city that's hosting the Grand Prix and the whole city should have an energy and be lit up. Yep. Um, I've, I've used the Super Bowl example because I've been to many, you know, and, you know, and you know, and I think what you know, what that really means is an event that captivates the city, you know, and the country. Um, you know, we're only in each country once, so yes. you know, it is clearly a special event. Um, but it's annual. It's not like a Super Bowl or a World Cup that comes and goes once every four years. You know, we're there every year, and we want to make that a celebration, you know, for the city and country we're in when we're there. Um, that engages more than just the track, engages the and whole that, city. That's great. Let's talk about China. We're in Asia and we can't not talk about China. Uh, between 10 teams and 20 drivers, we have more than 13 countries represented. There are currently no Asian drivers, as you know, and there's only one team that has an Asian owner, which is Vijay Malia of Force India. Recently, a Chinese consortium was going to club together with Ron to acquire um, McLaren, that didn't happen, yeah. and we've recently seen a clampdown by the Chinese government in terms of outbound investment. Can you tell us what your plans are for engaging with China and your recent collaboration uh, with Lagarde Sport? Yeah, I mean, I mean, China, obviously, for almost any business around the world, you know, that is a global business, China's, you know, um, it has to be a part of your future, um, you know. It's a sport, obviously, we're in early stage. Sort of the US and China, interesting, two, you know, you, you know for those in media and sports, enor yeah. global, you know, an enormous countries that for us, with enormous upside, because really we're, we're just scratching the surface in those places. So it's all upside opportunity. Um, and, you know, we actually think China, you know, is, uh, you know, is a great market for our sport, you know, great appreciation for Italian. We're, we're a sport that uniquely marries 
sporting competition to state-of-the-art technology. Mm -hmm. You know, it's obviously a country very in tune with that, you know, sort of the world of technology, yep. you know, loves the richness of the information and all that goes with our sport. Um, we think there's an incredible opportunity for us to develop it. We're proud of the race we have in, you know, in Shanghai. Um, but again, it's very early days. Um, you know, I think we do believe the right way to develop the sport in China. It's a complicated country, um, and I think um, we have Lagadar helping us navigate it. We think the right way to develop is try to find a Chinese partner, you know, who's not a partner in sort of one dimension, but really a partner for growing the sport mm -hmm. across the board, not a partner for the event or or digital platforms or television or sponsorships, but a partner that can really help us determine how do you maximize the potential of the sport um, in China. Okay. And uh, you know, we think that that type of insight and expertise to the Chinese marketplace is critical. Um, is critical. I mean, I, you know, sort of from the media world, I've lived trying to um, uh, develop businesses in China. Um, an incredibly exciting place, but um, but I think a, a place that you know, you really do need a degree of local, yeah. you know, somebody who understands how do you develop the market locally. I mean, it's true everywhere. I mean, in, you know, for us, for an event to really, for our sport to be what it is, you know, we bring sort of the global franchise, but, you know, we need to marry two strong local partners. Yeah. I and mean, here we've got a great, you know, local partners. And, you know, we've got to find, you know, to develop sports, those type of local partners. So China and Asia really as a whole. I mean, China's obviously, you know, the, you know, yes. the, the, you know, the big, the, the big player, but, you know, but Southeast Asia as a whole, incredibly exciting. You know, I mean, look, the growth of the world is going to get driven by, you know, by, by, by Asia. Um, well, over and, half the world's population live here, yeah. and they're waiting to be connected to more and more experiential sports. And I think they're, and, and realistically, they're probably a part of the world that's just growing into sports. Yes. I mean, sort of sports has not probably had the role it's had in yep. Europe and America. So I think, and, and I think as these events, you know, evolve and other, and sports grow, um, and I think the appreciation for what comes with them, um, you know, in a you know, I think it's all upside for us. So, you know, very important for us to, you know, to make sure we're thoughtful um, in how we're developing the opportunity for Formula One, you know, in China and Asia as a whole. Yeah. Chase, let's talk about the other big territory, which you, you mentioned briefly, the USA. So Liberty Media paid $4.4 .4 billion to acquire the majority control of Delta Top Co, but only about 1% of F1's revenue comes from the US, and there's only one race. Yeah. What are your plans for cracking the biggest TV advertising market in the world? So again, it's, you know, I think to what's it's all, I mean, first, it, you're right, and it's all opportunity. Mm -hmm. I mean, realistically, um, you know, the US, you know, is a, you know to, the, to the business today is a, you know, is a rounding error. Yeah. Um, and, and I think there's, you know, there's a much bigger fan base. I mean, it's not going to, we're not, you know, it's not going to replace the NFL. You know, but there's a much bigger fan base than anybody realizes for our sport. And probably the first place we can see the potential a little bit now is now that we're doing more in digital. You know, this this year for the first time, you just you see the size of the digital engagement. Yeah. I'm right, digital engagement in the U.S. is, you know, not that far off it is in Western Europe. And so wow. there's a, you know, there's a real passionate, you know, fan base. Uh, for us, it's not going to move the business in the next two to three years. But if in the sort of five to seven, five to ten year time frame, we think that's in a market with enormous potential. Um, and to develop the market, you got to do a lot of things. I mean, we've got to, you know, we've got to enable people to engage with the sport. Yeah. So it's building capabilities on digital platforms, whether it's social or apps or over the top. Or we've got to make the sport more accessible. Um, you know, you know, for fans. We've got to build, it. I talked about adding the event as a destination city. I think that helps, again, give it a visibility um, that, uh, that it doesn't have today. And you've got to have a long-term perspective. I mean, people have said, you know, well, they had races in the US that didn't work. And yeah. The problem is, you know, what we did was throw a race in Detroit or Phoenix or, you know, Denver and, or a parking lot in Las Vegas, and, you know, and it didn't work. But you can't, you can't go in to grow up sport in a place like the US yeah. and try it as a one-off with a, you know, a two-year deal. Right. I mean, it just it doesn't work. It isn't going to work. So you have to have the commitment you know, to, to grow and build on the things that do work and figure out what are the things you got to tweak and yeah. you know, move. Um, you know, we think you know, this is a sport you know, that really is unique in the world um, you know, in many ways. And you know, to make that, you know, those things accessible to, you know, to, you know, to fans in the U.S., you know, we think there's a real fan base that we can connect with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the interesting things about our, you know, fans is there's a large segment of our fans 
that are uniquely passionate about motorsport. Um, yeah. You know, it's one of our sponsors said the other day is um, that they can. There's a bunch of sports they can go to and reach the same fans in one sport. You know, but there's hundreds of millions of fans that they connect with with motorsports that they wouldn't. You know, they wouldn't reach to anything else. And so there is this. There's this segment of, of our fan base that is uniquely passionate about you know, Formula One, and, and that's true in the, you know, the U.S. too. I mean, just anecdotally, when I got this role, the number of you know, people that uh, came out of the woodwork as Formula One fans that you know, I knew through various venues in the U.S., and you know, some of them wouldn't know a football from a baseball, and yet they you know, live and die for Formula yeah. One. No, that's, that's fantastic. Let's talk about the fans. So there's a long-held perception that F1 fans are Rolex-wearing white middle-aged men, and that young people are not the sport's core customers. I'm not going to attribute that quote to anyone <laughs> in particular. <laughs> But is it correct? And how do you put the fan first in Formula One? So it's not like football, I can go out and kick a football or play cricket or whatever it is. How do you put the fan first in F1? Well, you gotta let the fans, you gotta let the fans connect and engage. I mean, I mean, you start with sort of the millennial age, the young today, I mean, you know, as everybody knows, they're not spending, you know, because when I was in, they're not watching TV the yeah. way you know, the parents right, do. Right. Um, but they're still engaging every bit as much. And they actually, if anything, care about their heroes and their stars and things they're passionate about. But you've got to enable them to connect, you know, in the ways they want to connect, mm -hmm. and you know, and and follow it, and um, you know, and uh, and understand it. And so, and then you got to market it. And you got to you got to make sure you know we you know we bring the stars out, we bring the things out to make the sport special, um, and develop those um, capabilities. So. Um, it is, and then have, you know, and build, you know, at every front, build events that capture, I mean, yep. you know, it's a, you know, again, they say, you know, increasingly, you know, what's valued in the world are experiences, not, ob not objects. So we've got to make, again, our experiences of going to something like um, an event like this, you know, one that is an experience that mm -hmm. is a memory people will take with them. And so it is, it is developing all those things that, you know, that really connect with, um, you know, connect with fans and enable fans to connect it. Um, and, and reach out through all the things that are available. And if you're not doing that, particularly as others are doing yes. it, you know, yes. you're, you're in a competitive world, yep. and you know, others will fill the space if we're not, if we're not doing it. But I think we've got unique things that enable us to, you know, to, to bring new fans to us, and you know, and yep. turn again casual fans into passionate ones if we're, you know, if we're connecting them with them in all the ways possible and delivering the right experience. So. You know, I think we're looking at ways, for example, next year to, to re-energize you know, just our traditional television broadcast with graphics and sound and other things that give it a freshness. I think we do a good job, but I think we've got to continue to challenge ourselves to provide things that you know, excite people and make the sport more you know, understanding, uh, understandable, and enable people to connect, yeah. you know, connect with it. Speaking of other sports, I mean, we heard yesterday um, the golf panel, which was very good, that sport and various other sports are looking at engaging with the next generation by experimenting with new formats. Now, is this something that, that you would consider um, a different F1 format, such as they have in F2, reverse grid or a sprint race? And would you do something, or is it too gimmicky, the Mayweather-McGregor? So you've got traditional boxing, you've got UFC. It was just a spectacular success by any metric. I mean. Do you see things evolving in F1 in terms of format? I think you know. I think you have to challenge yourself to be open-minded to think about you know, you know, um, you know, within reason. Obviously, all things you know being possible. I don't think you want to. I, I don't think you can be stuck in the past. So you wouldn't. Though that, you wouldn't though exclude that, anything. You wouldn't exclude anything. But that being said, on the flip side, I think you also need to be incredibly careful. You know, with a sport that has a rich history. And respect, you know, the, you know, respect what makes the sport, you know, has made the sport special, and, and respect that, you know, longtime fans have one perspective, new fans have yeah. a different. So I think just by definition, you know, you, you shouldn't be excluding anything because I think mm -hmm. it's healthy to evaluate all things. Um, but I think on the flip side, you know, you need to with a sport that has the richness of our history. I mean, when I was at Fox and we took the NFL and everybody thought we, we were accused, we were gonna have Bart Simpson announcing the NFL games yeah. and things like that. Um, and our first slogan coming out was same game, new attitude. You know, and I think that was sort of saying we wanted to respect, mm. you know, it was important to respect what made the NFL yeah. special, but 
not be bound by, you know, not being afraid to bring a new attitude to it and a new energy. So I think we, we brought innovation and energy to the presentation and the like and the sport and worked with the NFL and how do you, you know, continue to, to, you know, to grow and change the sport in healthy ways. So I think you always want to be challenging yourself to, 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 be, to be open to new ideas, but be very careful and respectful of a sport that, you know, has... Um, you know, has been you know such a special part of so many yeah. people's lives for a long time. And look, it's, it's not just fans that obviously are keen to understand what the evolution of the sport will bring, but it's also sponsors. As we know, notwithstanding the global nature of the sport, um, more than 50% of the races don't have a title F1 sponsor. And as yep. you know, Chase, we were talking earlier, a number of the teams still haven't replaced the tobacco sponsors yep. with a meaningful title sponsor. So really F1, in, in terms of sponsorship, you know, looks like it's lost its ground. Is that fair and what can be done to regain the territory? Um, well, I think it's certainly fair. We're not, you know, we have been, we have not developed the sponsorship opportunities um, in the way we need to and should, you know, and I think, you know, probably they're, you know, driven by, there are a lot of reasons, I'd say the two, you know, that, you know, drive it are, one, we didn't have, a, we didn't have an organization, yeah. you know, to engage, you know, so yeah. if you have one man show, there are going to be limits to how much um, you get done. And to some degree, because of that, we also had a very one dimensional, um, you know, relationship with sponsors. I mean, essentially our sponsors were, we're going to stick signs on a wall at the track and count how many minutes yeah. those signs well, show up, that, you know, show up on TV. And in this world where you've got platforms all over and different ways to engage and activate and, you know, and, um, and different opportunities for sponsors, we've got to develop, you know, those capabilities to, you know, to, uh, you know, to enable different sponsors with different goals in, in different capabilities um, and in different experiences um, to, you know, to maximize the full breadth of opportunities and then develop the tools. I mean, also when we went to a sponsor, you know, we didn't have any research, we didn't have any information. It was almost, our pitch was, you know, we got a black box and you got to pay us to, you know, get, to try and find out what's in the black box, but we're not going to tell you. And, and, um, and again, in a competitive world, you know, today where information and data, you know, is, um, you know, is, is the map to the future, you know, we've got a, you know, we've got to put forth what makes, you know, you know, tailor opportunities to sponsors and then put forth why those opportunities are going to deliver on their expectations. Yeah. And so, so, you know, we, we didn't have the organization, you know, the breadth of offerings, you know, or, you know, the tools behind it to create those experiences. And I think we need to work with our, you know, work with our teams as well. I mean, yeah. clearly, um, one of our goals is to make, you know, the you know, not just make the sport more competitive and the action better, but to make the sport healthier for everybody. I mean, today, what some of the teams spend to put a, spending half a billion dollars a yeah. year to put a team on the track, you know, is just doesn't make sense. Yes. Um, and it not only, you know, and it's, it, you know, and even the teams that spend it sort of know, ask us, you got to protect us from ourselves. Yeah. It's just a nuclear arms race. It's not creating a better product. It's reality creating a worse product because you're creating two classes of yeah. competitors, ones that spend a fraction of that and therefore, you know, can't really compete in the same way. So, so we've got to help our sponsor, help our teams. It's part of having, again, a shared vision, help our teams, you know, both make the sport, you know, sport on the track more competitive and make team ownership healthier. Um, and I think all of that will help, you know, them, uh, you know, engage in the yeah. right way on their opportunities and, you know, where we work with them. We want to make sponsors. In the past, it was all sort of teams competed with Formula One for sponsorships. Yeah. We want to make it a win-win. I mean, yeah. you know, our theme in, you know, in much of what we're doing, you know, with all the part, all the players, you know, we're dealing with here is trying to create, you know, win-win opportunities, grow the whole and then figure out how do we, you know, try to make one plus one is three and then figure out how do you yeah. share the benefit as yeah. opposed to in the past, one plus one is one and a half and, you know, who takes the, you know, who takes the hit. Well, just, just on that, it's a, it's a really good point because um, there are only 10 teams and over the last few years we've seen um, HRT, Caterham and Manor fail, um, go into to liquidation. Uh, we had a number of investors over the last two years come to us and, and look at doing significant DD. They went a long way down yep. the track, but they weren't convinced uh, of a compelling business model. How do you get more teams or more investors engaged in the sport? Well, I think we got to do the thing. That we, I mean, realistically, it's first and foremost, you know, get the, you know, get the sport, you know, um, you know, going in the right direction, which I think we've got. I think this year, um, you know, our attendance is up, our viewership's up. Yes. So build, improve the sport on the track. So all the things you need to to create momentum, to let the sport, you know, 
achieve, start to move to achieve the growth potential in, you know, in the Americas and Asia, um, you know, uh, strengthen the sport, you know, you know, across the board. So, um, you know, I think do those things and then make the business models better. So, uh, you know, I think for, you know, for the teams, you know, today, you know, the challenge ends up being you're either spending an extraordinary amount, you know, to compete or you're spending or your spending's more, you know, judicious yeah. and then, you know, but you're well, competing in the second half and yeah. that shouldn't be the trade-off. Everybody, we want a sport where an underdog has a chance to win. Everybody feels they can go out and compete um, and end up being, it's not about how much you spend, but it's about, we, we don't want to, you know, we, we don't want to dumb the sport down. You know, we are the pinnacle of motorsport and the pinnacle of automotive tech, you know, automotive sport, you know, technology. Um, we want to continue to be there, but we want to be about how well you spend your money, not how much you spend. And, you know, and I think there's plenty of room for us to do that, do it in an intelligent way, have great competition, you know, have cars that still, you know, again, amaze people yeah. um, and, and, and have a healthy business, you know, underneath it for all the players in it. And, yeah. you know, you go back to the promoters as well. I think, you know, you know, we do think our events have great value, but we haven't necessarily been delivering. We've got to continue to, with them, figure out how we make the events bigger, how do yeah. we make the event. So as opposed to saying, you know, how do you, you know, cut this or that, you know, I think what we've not been doing is, is really taking advantage of the franchise we've got and really delivering on the potential of Formula One and everything that should come with it. Are you um, confident, just in terms of the business model, we know that the next three years are going to be pretty tough in terms of your discussions to renew the Concord Agreement, which expires in 2020. How confident are you about reaching consensus? And if you look at the three levers which you hope will enable consensus to be reached, you've got, as you mentioned earlier, you've got cost control on one side, you've got increasing revenue on the other side, and perhaps more contentiously, you've got redistributing yep. the income amongst the teams in perhaps a more equitable way, which is going to clearly upset some of the top teams who've been there in terms of Ferrari, McLaren, etc. How confident you are in reaching a consensus? Look, I actually feel, you know, you're not naive about it. I mean, you know, you know, there'll always be you know, bumps getting there. Yep. Um, I think I feel very good because essentially, you know, we're confident we have a place we can get to where everybody is better off than they are today. Mm -hmm. You know, through those combination of things, you may still fight and you know, argue about, you know, the trade-offs, you know, sort of who could get what. But yes. if everybody's better off, mm. that's the place you should get to, you know. And I think if we can, you know, we have to do it in a way that people feel they've had a voice in it, they've had input, there's been transparency, you know. It's not sort of, you know, um, a game of trickery in yeah. the past, a sort of game yeah. playing. It's, you know, there, you know, there is an understanding, but we get to a place where, um, where, where everybody feels, you know, we're better off and the sport's better off, you know. So, you know, the, the part, the thing we all share in, which is the health of the sport, yes. is growing. Yep. So you're sharing in something that is getting better and your position in it is improved from where it is today. Yep. Um, whether that's competitively or economically, you know, or combination, yep. you know. And I think if that's where you get to, then again, not saying there won't be, you know, you know, life's always about sort of finding compromises, but, um, you know, I think, you know, intelligent people should be able to resolve that if, you know, it's not a win-lose, it's a win-win, and you're just fighting about who gets, you know, who, yeah. who has what, you know, what share of the benefit. Well, as a fan, best of luck with it, and I'm sure I speak for everybody else. Thank Let's you. talk about the real uh, heroes of the sport, and, and, and my own view is that there are, there's more than, than one hero, but I don't think, and I hope people would agree here, in the last 10 years, we've seen as many talented drivers, and I don't, I don't just mean the young drivers like Lance and Max, as we were saying, but what those young drivers are able to do is that they're, they're able to push, say, the Kimi Raikkonen, who's 38, the Alonso's of this world, 36, Philippe Massé, 36. So you've got a demographic duel between young and old. Um, you've also got, in, say, Force India, you've got Ocon and Perez, who yep. are just, that's a thrilling <laughs> duel going on right there. Um, and I don't know whether many people saw the, the social media that um, Lewis Hamilton did um, after he secured his 69th pole at Monza on Saturday night in the wet. I mean, it really was an inspiring yeah. bit of social media. He, he said in the lead up to it what he did in order to keep calm and, and stay focused. And he transmitted complete authenticity when he said, this is what I was born 
to do. Right. I mean, it just still makes the hairs on the back of my neck <laughs> stick up. Whether you like Lewis or not, how do you get more of those stories out there and the personalities of the drivers? Um, I mean, realistically, make sure we're doing everything to give them the opportunities to connect. I mean, when I first sat down with Lewis, his first request, I said, it was a week after, came in and he said, I'd love to be able to do a lot more, you know, to connect with my fans. And I said, in the past, every time I do something, I get a cease and desist letter. And so, yeah. so for us, it is about opening it up. I mean, this is a sport that seemed to, in the past, like to say no to everything, you know. So what we said is we want to start saying yes to a lot of things and letting people do things, letting fans do things, letting drivers do things, letting teams do things. It won't be everything, but, um, you know, but try and create a positive energy and excitement. You know, we've got, you know, we've got young and old, you know, drivers that are people's heroes that are great personalities, you know. I mean, sort of the Maxis and the, you know, Lances, we were talking about Danny Ricardo. I mean, yeah. a smile that goes from ear to ear every time you see him. I mean, they're great. And, you know, we've got to make sure we do everything we can to, um, you know, to provide people to, you know, to engage with that, to understand it, to connect with them, to follow them. Um, I mean, sports are built on emotion and drama, yeah. you know, and, you know, and we've got it. You talk about Ocon and Perez. I mean, sort of, not that we want to play them against each other, no, but no, no. it's part of life. And yeah. a competition, you know, has those edges to it. And so what we've got to do is have the people that search out and find those stories, those moments, those dramas. I mean, everybody cited with nothing to do with competition, but the, the crying six-year-old in, yes. in Barcelona yeah. we brought down to meet Kimi Raikkonen. Yeah, how do you was, find... That was fantastic. You know, how do you find yeah. those moments? And, yeah. you know, or touching... Which was very touching, you know, Michael Schumacher's son, you know, taking his car around the track, yeah. you know, in Spa. I mean, you know, it is about finding things that touch people's, you know, hearts or, you know, you know sort of make them proud or excited yeah. or emotional yeah. and, you know, find all those things. And ultimately, it, a lot of it comes from people, which yes. is why it's important to take the drivers and enable them, you know, their personalities to come out, their stories to come out. I mean, Kimmy, everybody who says, cool. you know, he was fabulous with the, you know, the young boy. And, yes. you know, you, you, yeah, you call was. him the Iceman. And he, yeah. you know, he was, you know, fabulous signing the hat and spending time with Absolutely. him. Absolutely. You know, I think it is about you know making sure we do everything we can to provide those things to come through. Do you think there are some stories too? I mean, the, the some of the criticisms around um, the technology and the rules, it, it's too complex. Do you think there is a there is a, a more simpler narrative between the relationship that the driver has with his engineers, which is a very yeah. close relationship, as, yeah. as those of us have been involved in in motorsport, but also the pit crew, because there's yeah. a whole team work. Um, culture and discipline that goes on there that, that I think we miss. Do you think there's more that can be done? Well, I think there's more. I, I do think it needs to be simplified some. I think we've let some of the remain, you know, the race in Monza last week where we had half the cars with some form of penalty that nobody yes. can understand. Yeah, I don't I, think, you know, I don't think serves as well. Yeah. And I think the, you know, the intent of why that, those structures came in place, you know, I understand, but they haven't served that purpose. Mm. You know, I mean, one of the problems, we didn't have the expertise in the past um, to, to make sure. So Ross Braun, who has been a wonderful um, you know, addition, yeah. you know, comes in yeah. and has built a team with him that will make us much more thoughtful about making sure, you know, what's the right way to, um, for the sport to go forward um, and, uh, and not have, you know, you need rules, but the rules should be simple enough to understand, shouldn't distort, you know, um, the, the competition. You know, we do need to make, I mean, Nicky Lauda's famous line, you know, famous statement to me, is always let the drivers drive. Yeah. And so, you know, we want that, you know, I think, you know, the engineers matter, but it should first and foremost be about, you know, the drivers and the competition, you know, with the engineers supporting them, not about the engineers, you know, sort of, um, you know, overriding, you know, the driving competition. So all of these things are balances and, you know, and trade-offs. Um, but, um, and I think there are things we can do to, as I said, make it a sport that we need to keep remembering. This isn't a sport we run for the teams. This yes. is, I mean, we want it to be good for the teams. It's a sport for the fans. Yeah. And we got to look at everything from a fan lens back. Yeah. You know, and remember and realize some fans are casual fans, some fans are hardcore fans. So how do you have things that um, speak to, you know, each yeah. type of fan in the right, you know, in the right way and make it understandable and, um, and, uh, and something they can, you know, truly engage in in a rewarding way. Um, I'm just conscious of time. We've got four more questions. Um, the path to Formula One, it's very expensive. Um, it costs approximately 1.5 to 2 million euros just to pay for the privilege of driving in Formula 2. You need to be in a winning team. You need to secure a, four, a super license, which is 40 points over three years. And even then, you're not 
guaranteed that you'll get a slot at the top table in Formula One. And the barriers to entry are very high, and not many people have the backing of the financial resources, say that the Lance Strolls of this world do. What are you doing in order to ensure that there's a sustainable race yeah. theories or that the path to Formula One is at least sustainable and secure? Um, I think we want to play a much larger role in sort of the development end of the sport. I mean, in the past, you know, I think the way it was was sort of they, Formula One ran Formula One and didn't, you know, didn't, didn't, wasn't that involved in sort of anything that happened, you know, in getting to Formula One. Um, so, you know, we have, uh, you know, we with, we've with the FIA worked up. Um, you know, to turn GP2 into Formula 2, um, you know, I think the logical step would be to figure out how we make GP3 and Formula 3 into Formula 3. So we yeah. have a sort of a, you know, a pyramid. I mean, MotoGP's done a good job of that, of sort of, you know, having, you know, Formula 3, Formula 2, Formula 1. You can follow the young drivers coming through. You know, even from there, then how do you get into regional development? And everybody talks about the importance of having, you know, a driver develop from, you know, from Asia. You know, if you had a driver from Southeast Asia, from um, you know, from China, you know, from Brazil, from America. And so to have that, how do you create, you know, even work with those entities to have vehicles? And, and some of it can be at our events. I mean, one of the things Formula One in the past has not been, you know, particularly inviting to is, is being a, you know, a, a weekend platform when our races are there, you know, for other forms of racing. And we want to, you know, we're the pinnacle of motorsport and we want to embrace other forms yeah. of racing and have, you know, those be, um, you, know, um, you know, paths through which, you know, drivers can emerge and opportunities can emerge. So, you know, we are, we're, we're trying to work with the array of organizations to figure out how do we play more of a role in developing um, the sport, well, it's, um, you know, and the, and the drivers yeah. and the players, you know, through it. Well, it's got to be in the best interest of sport. And going back to the point that you were making about stories, I mean, you know, if I'm a, a sponsor or a fan, I, I want to be part of the journey. So yeah. the struggle, you know, the, the human drama of yep. the lower teams and the ability to, to try and fight for a, yep. a seat in F1. Um, last question. Last season, the Drivers' Championship went to the wire. So who do you think will win this <laughs> year and who do you want to win? <laughs> yeah. All I want is it to be undecided in Abu Dhabi, you know? Like, we want, you know, <laughs> we want great competition, you know? Um, you know, we want it even better. I mean, it's been you know, it's been a good year in that way, having Ferrari and Mercedes you know, competing. Yeah. Um, you know, having you know Sebastian and Lewis you know competing at the top. Um, you know, we'd like it to go down to the wire. You know, we want the races to be close. We'd love a surprise here and there. I mean, yeah. a race like Baku. You know, when you know yeah. Lance Stroll ends up on a podium. You know, it's great for us. So I think you know it is part of I me. Mean, part of what makes sports special is the unexpected or the surprise or the underdog. Yeah. And so hopefully, I have more of that. But it's first and foremost competition. So we just, you know, we want great racing, great action, and you know, um, and we want it to go, you know, to the very end. Well, look, it's been absolutely fabulous to have you with us. We could go on. I'm conscious of time, so we're going to draw it to a close. Um, please join me in a moment in welcoming Chase Kerry and in thanking him. I have to say, I don't think in all the years that I've been involved in Formula One, and I mentioned this to you, I was at Albert Park and then at Monza, there really is a palpable change. There really is a sense of excitement. Obviously, there's a lot still to do, as you said. Yeah, it's early but days. I, but as a fan, I just can't wait. So yeah. thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.